Thanks, Matthew. So I'm really proud to present this next session on um, cross-cultural perspectives and local participation. We've got some uh, fantastic panelists here, and I'm just going to start with just a few remarks about my, uh, guess, my own personal interest in this topic and why I think it's important. We've already had some remarks along these lines um, about the importance of taking these dynamics into account. For example, spoke about values of alignment this morning, and it's like, well, whose values? Because people have different value systems in different places. Um, and this is really a problem that the importance of recognizing this is increasingly um, seen as vital in my own field of psychology. Uh, people are probably familiar with an article in 2010. Most people are not weird. Um, anyone not know the article? Um, Joe Henrich and colleagues, you know, they pointed out that you know, the vast majority of research in psychology is conducted both by and on people in places they call Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. I mean, that's not to say there's a binary distinction between weird and non-weird. Each letter is a spectrum in which you can differentiate countries. But it remains the case that um, you know, the, the majority of work is firstly on people in those places, which is an issue, but also by people in or from those places, which is also an issue when it comes to how we think about flourishing and stuff. I just want to share a quick anecdote of why, why I'm really interested in this topic, because my, my own personal focus has really been on cross-cultural perspectives on well-being. But when I was 19, I went to China to teach English for six months before university on a gap year. Um, and you know, the trip just exploded my horizons in every respect, intellectually, cognitively, emotionally. You know, and I traveled around and went to Taoist and Buddhist monasteries. And even in my kind of naive way, could glimpse like the intricate theories of the mind and of well-being and of life in these different traditions. Um, and I came back to the UK to study psychology, and then none of that was anywhere. I mean, mindfulness was beginning to creep in just very slightly in a kind of decontextualized way, but aware of this vast kind of treasure house, as it were, of kind of insights into the mind in other cultures, and then realizing that just wasn't anywhere in the textbooks that, that I was studying. Um, and so that insight really stayed with me um, as I kind of carried on my career in psychology. So in, in various ways, we've been trying to be part of a movement to address that, because people acknowledge it's an issue, and then they're making steps towards addressing it. So um, for the last few years, I've been Firstly, involved with an initiative called the Global Wellbeing Initiative, which is a partnership between Gallup and the Japanese Foundation called Wellbeing for Planet Earth. Because the Gallup World Poll, they've really excelled in studying people globally since 2005 with their World Poll. So that's, that's really important in terms of the participants. But I also mentioned it's an issue in terms of the, the scholars themselves and the concepts we use, because you could still make the case that even if they do research globally, it's with ideas that reflect the Western context in which many researchers have emerged. So given this eastern location of the, the foundation, they wanted to identify other aspects associated with well-being, associated with you know, Japanese cultures and eastern cultures more broadly. Side note here, I'm aware of the kind of dangers of using broad generalizations of east and west, and because as we, as we got into the discussions, in fact, we wanted to develop a module of items that reflected this kind of eastern sensibility. And we've, we've landed on balance and harmony. But as soon as you get into it, you realize that these may have been given greater attention in the East, but they're not Eastern concepts, and they, they matter to people globally. So there's so many interesting dynamics around uh, how we conceptualize well-being, um, what's universal, what's particular to different places. But nevertheless, we've, we've found this has been a really nice addition to the Gallup World Poll, this module on balance and harmony. Um, and then this has been joined in the last, really, just year or two. Well, it's been several years in the making, but the Global Flourishing Study, because the Gallup World Poll surveys some 140 countries annually. But it's not, and it's every year, but it's not truly longitudinal because it's different people each year. So um, my director, Tyler Vanderweel, in collaboration with Baylor University, Byron Johnson there, has formulated a global flourishing study. It's smaller in terms of countries. It's 22 countries, 200,000 people. But it's truly longitudinal, so it's tracking the same people over time. Um, and we have around 100 questions relating to different aspects of flourishing, drawing some from the work we've done with the Global Wellbeing Initiative, um, others through kind of conversations with people like Ron and, and groups here, and then also just drawing on the work of the Gallup World Poll. So again, it's an, another contribution to this kind of wave of global scholarship, really trying to get into the, the lives and perspectives of people in different cultures. So I guess really the topic of this panel is, given what we're trying to do here, and then, you know, especially in terms of thinking about AI and the issues that brings up is, how can and should we take let's call them cultural issues or cultural diversity into account. So um, I just have an open question for any reflections. I'll go, we'll go through the panelists in turn. 
just to share whatever thoughts um, and reflections either you've had in advance of today or in light of what's come up so far, um, a space for, you know, for five minutes each, and then after they've taken their turn, we'll open the space up for questions and try and uh, have a conversation. Um, let me just quickly introduce our great panelists. Um, apologies if I get any kind of pronunciations wrong, but first of all, we have uh, um, Mila uh, Ali Aliana, an advisor at the Pro-Social Global Solution Insti Initiative. Sorry? Oh, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. I'll get you to say a bit more um, uh, uh, by way of instruction when, uh, when we take it in turn. We also have um, Brandon Bajanathan, um, an associate professor at the, and department chair of sociology at the Catholic University of America. We have Michael Muthukrishna, associate professor of economic psychology at the London School of Economics. We have Victor Counted, a colleague at the Human Flourishing Program. Uh, also a professor at Regent University. Uh, we have Monica, you might be right here. Ah, okay, great. Uh, well, Monica uh, Aleman, uh, International Program Director of the Ford Foundation, uh, and Thomas Bjorkman, founder of uh, Elskaret Foundation. I hope that's, oh, there you are, <laughs> sorry. So I hope that's correct. So I'd love to turn it over to you in the terms, in the kind of order I read out the names. Like I say, if you can, four or five minutes, just for your reflections on cross-cultural issues, especially as they pertain to what topics of the session here, uh, of the summit here, um, and then we'll open up for questions from everyone else. So, um, uh, Mila, would you like to go first? Can you hear me? So I'd like to start, because this, we are in a sacred place, to say, Hello, my other self. Because I come from indigenous background, and I would like to bring the voice of indigenous and also the global south. Not that I'm representing any of them, but just uh, to acknowledge a different voice. Um, so I would like to bring some cultural perspective to consider. And there are three that I would like to bring to this uh, conversation, honorable conversation in this beautiful, sacred place that has many history. And the three points that I'd like to make, the time allocated, one is about invisibility, two is nature or life's principles, and third is that technology is not the driver of innovation, but it's just an enabler of innovation. So the first is invisibility, and the best way for me to bring this in from um, indigenous wisdom and pathways is to invite you all to see an embodiment of invisibility and how does that translate into any technology including AI. So I'm going to do the same gesture with different intentions and I invite you to guess what it is. So my first gesture, the same gesture with different intention, let me prepare. It's going to, the second is going to be the same gesture with different intention. I'm hearing some laughter, some, what do you think the first one was? Or the second one? Anyone? Just, because I can see some faces. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Did anyone also pick that up? A lot of nods. We're different cultures. That was invisible, yet yeah, you got it. And in the indigenous pathways, there's things that are invisible. Spirituality is part of that. Invisibility is part of life. And yet, AI cannot replicate, not at least in this present technology. So if we think AI is going to be the, sol the solution and the savior of our humanity and of our planet and of life, that is misnomer. I just demonstrated there's different ways of us communicating. And it was through energy, vibration, facial recognition that is very, very minute. So that's one. That's a cultural perspective that we need to consider. Second is nature's principle. There are these nine. I'm not going to go through each one of them. And nature's principles are actually is what indigenous 
would say when we are facing a problem. One is, for every problem, the answer is community. Second is, what would nature do? Or, what would life do? What would love do? Right? So, in nature's principles, I'll give you some examples. Nature runs on sunlight and also uses the energy it needs. That means we are not <laughs> running on sunlight. Sunlight is free at the moment. Technology, especially AI, uses petabytes to run its program, its LLMs, the large language models. That takes the power of energy of a manufacturing plant, and the more it increases, it increases energy and power that the electricity is not able to run on renewable uh, sources. It's running on fossil fuel. Back to square one. We do not talk about this in this conversation. There is human flourishing. Human flourishing cannot coexist without the ecosystem that supports it. And nature is a limited capacity that needs hundreds and hundreds of years to renew. And yet we're consuming at a faster rate than the planet can hold us. So there's that, nature principles. There's also nature fits form to function, and this is coming back to technology as enabler. So nature, everything in nature is designed for a function. That actually then, that, that, is, that function fulfills the design. Yet what we're doing is, do we actually know to Kayan's point what DSI is? What is the function? Do we actually agree what that function is? One example is communication. I can communicate from you from remote, from A to B. That existed from time immemorial, but the technology was from hand signals to, you know, uh, from mountains, smoke signals, to telegraph, to the phone, to the internet, and now using drones through the uh, telepathic, right? But if you get stuck on the technology, you get stuck in the Morse code using today. We can use all of those technologies. But if you focus on the function, the function becomes immemorial. Have we all agreed on that function for AI, for any technology? So then there's also nature recycles everything. It's zero waste. We are nature. We are going to be the seed for the next generation. So death is part of it. Death is the compass for new birth, for any kind of evolution. And yet, we don't design for evolutionary design or life cycle design in any of our products and services. We do not, we, we focus on growth, maximization, and output, economy, yet it's completely opposite to how life has been on Earth as well as in the universe. It's 13.5 billion wisdom, and yet we haven't understood how to align ourselves to life itself. We are nature. So there's different things like nature banks on diversity, which is part of the conversation we're having. Um, and also, nature taps the power of limit. When is enough is enough. AI is the same. Do we go into an AI journey? At which point do we tap into saying this is enough? That will harm not only us as humans, but the whole ecosystem. And for us indigenous people, we, we think in our decision making of future generation, not just the present. And that's not a conversation I'm hearing either in flourishing. Flourishing does not exist in a separate continuum of time and space. We impact that. We are impacted by our past, our ancestry. We are also impacting the future, but also the multiple dimension that we live in. So on that note, it comes back to that technology the third. Why are we focusing on technology as a driver of innovation instead of the enabler and amplifying things that we can't do as human, which is the amplification of effectiveness and efficiency? And that is what you see also in social media, in technology, the amplification of human biases, cancel culture, mental health issues, loneliness, the technology that connects is actually imposing disconnection on many levels. So that's how I would like to end. Something to consider of all those three. And the life principle actually covers 
a lot of the impediments that we're facing. Um, some really important points and amazing food for thought. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Brandon, would you like to go next? Is this working? Okay, perfect. Great. Well, well I want to. First of all, thank, thank you for the invitation, uh, Matthew, and uh, it's really such an honor to be here uh, once again. And I have to also apologize that I arrived at 7 this morning, didn't sleep on the flight last night, and the jet lag is hitting hard, man. So I'm <laughs> really uh, going try to try to be coherent as I, as I um, try to offer some thoughts. So um, OK, so the first thing that so uh, I'm just going to voice a few things that, that have been kind of sort of lingering um, in my mind through this uh, through the sessions this morning. One is this issue of, of uh, ordering and weighting the different uh, components of flourishing, right? And so whether it's the six different um, pieces of the flourishing index, right? So the, the mental and physical health and the life satisfaction and, and uh, relationships, et cetera, right? So the, the way that, that a quantitative measure is, is designed and currently used is that all of those elements are equally ordered. They are all equally weighted. And, and that, that raises an important problem because I'm not aware of any culture in which um, one might valorize the kind of person who, for the sake of material stability, forsakes meaning and purpose. Um, right. So you can have two individuals, right, who have the same score, but one has super high on the material, you know, flourishing aspect, and then a low score on the meaning and purpose, and another one with exactly the opposite. But but it's fairly universal that that we tend to valorize people who have sacrificed uh, of themselves for the sake of um, something higher, and so. It raises some important questions as to then what you know what does that look like um, you know uh, yeah for for measuring flourishing uh, in, either in general or in any particular society right and how do you set those weights and it, it poses a really uh, important challenge to think about the other kind of challenge that that occurs to me is uh, a lot of our measures of flourishing could also indicate at least at the individual level or even at societal levels, high levels of flourishing, even if those, um, you know, the, the, those, those, those indicators of, of flourishing uh, neglect the ways in which that kind of uh, capacity is, is actualized at the expense of other societies, right? So a lot of us in the West are, are you know, able to, to thrive because we are exploitative of societies in the third world. Um, so it is an analog of what I call the happy Nazi pro problem, which is the, the problem with positive psychology, right, where you, you can have uh, strong indicators of subjective well-being in Nazi Germany uh, without realizing that that's not really a good indicator of flourishing. So um, I don't quite know how one solves that. Um, it's, it's a really important challenge, though, I think, in, in terms of thinking about cross-cultural issues, because if one, one society is thriving at the expense of another, I don't think it makes sense to consider the first society thriving. Um, there's also um, another kind of issue with, with flourishing, as we're seeing. So this snapshot, again, I want to say this is super uh, helpful, and especially, I think, a huge advance since the last time. It's just I don't quite know how one would operationalize it in light of this other issue, which has to do with, with, with temporality. So there's a difference between measuring flourishing at a point in time versus looking at one's narrative arc. When you ask people at the end of their lives, um, you know, and this is, I've been doing this project recently, the last few months, this is fresh on my mind, talking to scientists around uh, issues of longing and yearning. And um, we, we asked them, off, you know, at the end of the interview, uh, you know, if you only had six months to live, what would you do differently? And, and, and a lot of people would do a lot of things differently. And, and they always have to do with, with very few things. They have to do with, with relationships with people who matter to them maybe to sort of a big sort of vocational thing, wanting to sort of really understand some problem and wish they would have dedicated more life to it. But I don't think they would bemoan, um, you know, personal physical suffering or, or that they, had, they didn't, you know, sort of, uh, in fact, they would, they would probably regret having, having protected themselves and put up walls that, you know, for the sake of self-protection and so on. So, so it looks a bit different, um, you know, if, if, you, if you look at a sort of snapshot measure of flourishing versus what's, what is a, a well-lived life at the end of one's life, and what kinds of criteria do we use? And those vary, I think, you know, uh, across societies. And, and, and one of the axes along which some of these indicators of flourishing might vary is whether those societies are, um, you know, whether the kind of admirable life is one that's more particularist, that is tied to one's tribe, tied to one's community, and 
uh, you know, have I dedicated myself to, to um, the glorification of my country? So I grew up in the Arabian Gulf, and some of those societies are really, uh, you know, they valorize the, the particular narrative of this ethnic community that, uh, you know, came to political power you know, only a few years ago, but they have a glorious narrative of here's who we are and here's our contribution to, to humanity, to civilization, and it's a futuristic vision and so on. But it's certainly not universalist. It's not sort of in service of the world in ways that a lot of Western societies are. Uh, so it becomes tricky then to impose a universalist conception of flourishing uh, if it would be alien to them, um, at least if, if we're using these self-reported measures of flourishing. So, so, so it becomes challenging again as to how, how one measures this across societies. And then there were a couple of other things that I thought uh, we may want to think about in, in, in terms of um, what might be maybe missing from our understanding of flourishing here, and, and from one perspective, from say a Christian perspective, are the theological virtues necessary for flourishing, faith, hope, and love. Um, it's, it's, it was surprising to me to see an in, like sort of a comprehensive map of flourishing without love at the center, right? Willing the good of the other um, as being the fundamental orientation, uh, which, which, which I think is, is worth, worth thinking about. Um, other issues of suffering that, that, that have been mentioned are, are interesting to think about. Is, is suffering necessary for us to flourish? And if so, does it need to be incorporated somehow as, as a condition for flourishing? I don't quite know how one would do that. Um, and then there's some other, one more piece on, on particularity. For, for a few years here in Italy with some colleagues at uh, the Catholic University of Milan, I've been working on this project on social generativity. And we've been trying to map out organizations, companies that are trying to um, pave a, a way beyond consumer society. And one of the indicators of thriving uh, companies, flourishing companies, if you will, was a, an ability to connect past, present, and future. And Italy is ex exceptionally good at doing that because they have these prodotti tipici. They have this sort of uh, you know, uh, affinity for place that doesn't quite exist in the United States, for instance. And so, so that sense of rootedness, where you innovate based on your, your ties to the land, where you're, you're, your ties to the past, uh, as an important component of, of, of one's identity, but also what it means to flourish as, as a company, but also as a country, um, that's certainly missing in some other contexts like the US. And, and so how do we think about the role of those, uh, the social and cultural dimensions of flourishing in our, in our measures? So I will stop there. Uh, wonderful, thanks Brandon, that's uh, brilliant too. Yeah, such important points as well. Um, Michael, if I turn it over to you. to be able to, to speak to this group here. Um, while I was outside, I took a photo with, um, with Lamartre. And you know, famously, you know, he solved Einstein's field equations and thereby discovered the Big Bang. And the story goes that he, he presented this to the Pope, and the, the Pope was very excited and said, you know, we've discovered the creation moment, because prior to that, they thought of a steady state universe. And Lamartre, I think, was very wise in, in saying, no, actually, it could be that science is a conversation that happens with faith. It's ongoing, and you don't want to hang your hat on any particular discovery. And so I'm just glad to be able to be here to, to share a conversation that happens between faith and science in my own head and share with you some of the scientific discoveries about human evolution and about human flourishing. How is it that we've been able to live in a world that we live in today? And so I think you know one of the major discoveries in in, in, our, in our species, and what makes us so different to other animals is the realization that the culture is at the center of it. So what makes humans so different to other animals is our capacity for, for cultural software, the ability to flexibly hold beliefs and values and traits, a variety of which, and discover entirely new mental faculties that our ancestors didn't have and that aren't present across the globe. So just to give you an example of that, um, you know, we often think about reasoning as something that humans are capable of. But in part, that's endowed to us by thousands of years of accumulated cultural knowledge. The, the psychologist uh, Alexander Luria was in Uzbekistan, and he wanted to understand the effects of education on our cognition. And so he gave people questions uh, that were just iffy then Q reasoning. So he said, you know, uh, where it snows, the bears are white. In Navaya Zemlia, it snows what color the bears there. And everyone with education said white. And my six-year-olds would say white. And everyone in this room immediately thought white. But when he asked people who hadn't been exposed to schooling, they said things like this. Um, I've seen a brown bear once. I think maybe brown? 
Uh, I've never been, I don't know. And that's because it's not that humans can't reason, it's that we are endowed, we're taught, we're encouraged, and we are, we're given a system where reason is happening all around us, and we begin to store that new mental faculty. Another clear example, if you don't believe that data, oh, I should say, you know, we replicated that same effect uh, last year at our field site in Namibia and Angola, where we have a natural experiment happening there too. But another example of this is numeracy. So, you know, we count, uh, and, and we know that humans can count, but our ancestors in many groups today count like this, one, two, three, many. And it took a very long time to get to a number system, and it was a natural number system based on body parts, like we use 10, it's a terrible system, it doesn't map to binary, I would have much preferred hexadecimal. Um, and, you know, even once we discovered natural numbers, we used stones and notches, it took centuries to get to the concept of zero, and negative numbers, you know, Francis Mazuriz, the Canadian-British mathematician in the 17th century, said negative numbers darken the very fabric of reality. It's not easy to represent zero or negative numbers on our body parts or with stones. And it took us moving uh, from objects to, to move in a position on a number line to be able to represent zero and then easily transmit it to children. So much of what, much of what we do in the world, much of what we believe, are these culturally accumulated traits that have spread around the world. And religion, and the Catholic Church, and Christianity in particular, have spread many of those values. So before we, you know, we were talking a lot about AI alignment today. And the challenge from this science is that first off, if culture is the means by which we adapt to different environments around the world, it is unsurprising that we find very different value systems around the world. But it's also not unsurprising that uh, certain value systems have spread and that we have been quite successful at creating human alignment before we get to AI alignment. The rise of uh, emancipatory values, right? So if you look at our major religious texts, uh, Christian or otherwise, they don't tell you not to have slaves. Slavery was an ever-present reality all around the world. It tells you how to treat your slaves. But on the basis of that, we, you know, the Quakers in particular, people like Wilberforce, right, who said, actually, we are created in God's image. There is a fundamental equality to us. To states things like, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. It's not self-evident. And it's a little bit like, you know, the lady doth protest too much. You wouldn't have had to say it was self-evident if it really was. But on the basis of that, this idea, you're able to, to, to move forward, and, and slavery has become an unthinkable idea. The rise of human rights is another example of alignment. One of the problems that I work on is that the scale of cooperation, our ability to work with one another, has ratcheted upward in this tremendously fast way. We were bands of hunter-gatherers largely based on kin, working with one another, spreading across the globe to every available ecosystem, culturally adapting to those environments. And then, Bands would fight against bands, and eventually it was villages against villages, regions against regions, nation states against nation states. One thing that religion was able to, to give us was a mechanism and an institution, a proto-institution, by which we could rise above our ethnicities, bound by these common beliefs, to the point where religion itself became a mechanism that came into conflict with one another. But it's not just, it's not just the beliefs, it's also the interaction between the beliefs and whether it, whether it pays to cooperate at a higher scale or whether it's better for me to just work with my own family and my friends. If you look at any, any graph of human progress, right, anything, so scale of cooperation, GDP per capita, child survival rates, uh, lifespan, you see something very strange. The Black Death, the Renaissance, uh, the Enlightenment, all of these are blips on this graph until we get to the Industrial Revolution. And then the whole thing just ratchets upward in a, in a hockey stick way. It just goes off into, into the sky. And I argue, and, you know, and others have argued, that part of what we've done there is that our ability to cooperate with one another in the way that you know, Dennis described, and I really like how James said, culture is cultivation, and it is through that cultivation that we can flourish with the right traits, plus this abundant technology, millions of years worth of stored sunlight. We were able to expand our capabilities. We were able to grow our groups, and we were able to uh, expand certain things. So the idea of, for example, um, non-family-based corporations is an amazing tool by which we can allocate talent and, and then expand. But then, of course, that also leads to the spread of colonialization. 
it leads to this great divergence where Europe takes off and the rest of the world you know, takes a while before they industrialize and converge. So to my mind, just reflecting on some of the things around AI is that it's a classic dual use technology. I'm, I'm trained as an engineer, that's how I like to think about things, that uh, it's like electricity or nuclear power or flight. You can build nuclear power stations or you can build a bomb. You can fly us across the globe or you can shoot missiles. And so I'm less, I guess, when I talk about the alignment problem, I'm less worried about AGI. First off, because we now understand that human intelligence was a distributed act. We are vastly ignorant about many things. A single individual, no matter how smart, is embedded in the world, and it's not really a threat. But together, our greatest achievements and our worst atrocities were all done as, as collective units. And what you need to understand is how we were capable of doing that. The second issue is that when we're talking about alignment, we're talking about alignment right now. We're talking about the use of AI technologies as they can be used right now, and there are dangers and benefits. There's a, there's a powerful ability for AI as therapy for everyone, or as a means to provide education to people who don't currently have access, or even medical care. But on the other hand, the world leader at the moment in, uh, in, in vision AI is not the United States, it's China, because they have easier access to uh, free, you know, you, have, you can basically use without all those patents getting in the way and all of the, uh, the privacy laws getting in the way, an ability to train vision AI. And they're the big uh, exporter of that technology to autocratic governments around the world. And so some of what I see in terms of this alignment issue is that it was very easy for Francis Fukuyama to write the end of history right after the fall of the Cold War. And it was very easy to celebrate that the liberal democracies were the way forward until you have the rise of, of, alternative, of alternative models. But again, you know, speaking from the science, one of the principles is that it's easier to be nice when there's more to go around. People are better to one another when we can all flourish. And many of the challenges that we face, whether we, we tackle them or not, about millions streaming across borders the world over would not happen if there was greater equity. I, I sometimes think, would we have had a century of peace if we didn't help Germany redevelop? And could we have had a different world if we had somehow helped Russia develop? And so human flourishing, you know, I think the science does speak to this, but it can only speak to it so far. And embedded in this is, I think, an idea that our values and our uh, values that aren't necessarily arrivable through science, but a commitment to those values, plus the science is the core of creating a world where we can all flourish. Thank you, that was fascinating. Very well said, thank you. Um, Nick. Very really honored to be here. I want to thank um, Matt and uh, Ron for having me. Good to be back. Um, I think my conversation has always been what most of you know me for. Um, my emphasis on place, the importance of kind of centralizing place and the conversation on human flourishing. I'm happy that Brandon had touched on that a bit. Because I think in order to, it's important that we start with place. And ask the question, how does the place that we find ourselves shape um, how we flourish? Uh, or rather the unique ways in which we uh, flourish. Um, team and I have been kind of brainstorming on this. And we had a paper where we try to look at what we call spatial well-being. Um, and we're lucky to get uh, data from Gallup to do that. And essentially trying to point to the fact that uh, for most people, uh, place really plays a huge role in terms of how to flourish. And really even looking at the framework itself, one of the questions that comes to mind, especially as we look at the values and the ends is that sacred, the idea of the sacred is very contextual and spatial. Um, what is sacred to those in a Western context might be different for those in a different context. And so in order for us to really get to the root of what it is, uh, I think it's important to take on that spatial lens um, in terms of how we look at or conceptualize flourishing. But also beyond just that, um, even what is useful, for example, uh, one of the cases that I've made with um, the current uh, framework, the human flourishing framework uh, that Tyler had put out, which I think is an excellent model, um, it's even when we think about uh, the different domains or dimensions, what does that look like when we look at it spatially uh, from a place perspective, for example? Uh, one of the things that we've done is 
for example, let's say we didn't, let's say we study uh, the largest religious group in the world, the Christian community, uh, with over 2.8 billion population around the world. What does flourishing really look like to them, right? And when we look at this group, what's useful for this group? Using, let's say, Vanderbilt's model, and we know, for example, uh, in our abundant life flourishing framework we're trying to put together, one of the cases that we've made is that happiness and life satisfaction for Christians is not really the goal. However, we know that if we have peace and joy, that we'll get to happiness and we'll get to we'll essentially live a satisfied life. And also even with financial and material stability, it's a good thing, but for Christians in that context, it's not really as important than stewardship. We know that if we're good stewards, essentially, we are going to have better financial and material stability. And so it's just that reframing of how we look at human flourishing, essentially, and taking a spatial contextual lens to look at, okay, if we're talking about this stuff, I know the con uh, construct is hope. Uh, how does place really shape uh, the aspirations of hope? Because we know that for most people, uh, we, we uh, recently wrote a, a paper with a colleague, a philosopher, and we tried to we call it special hope, essentially. And it's really the idea that for some people, um, uh, for the privileged and the underprivileged, the way that their hopeful aspiration is different. For the rich and poor, for the disabled and the able, the way that they are hopeful um, is very different. And it's contingent on the place that they find themselves. And so I think that uh, rethinking of how place kind of shapes uh, how we conceptualize uh, human flourishing, I think it's important. And, and I appreciate the fact that I see some aspect of that, at least the geographic play in the model. Um, I did make a case for that last year, so I'm happy to see that. And also I'm happy to see natural environment. However, I would say that um, it's good that this is acknowledged, at least the geographic place as an influencer, as an influencer of this particular uh, framework. But Overall, uh, when we think about this, how do we really uh, capture this trend across cultures? Uh, let's say when we look at human flourishing within an African framework, what does that look like? When we look at it uh, within a different cross-cultural context, what essentially uh, does that look like? And when I talk about place, essentially, uh, it's not just the physical geographic place. Uh, it could be the personal, it could be at the personal dimension or the social or even the cultural uh, dimension. And understanding these different nuances, I think, and the interactions or the relationship or the connections that people have with specific places kind of changes the way we uh, look at the paradigm of human flourishing. Um, but I'm, I'm you know, quite uh, happy to see what we have. And really, when we think about AI, and think about what would it look like, for example, to build habitats of flourishing, right? What would that really look like practically if every organization was centralized place in how they uh, have conversation around well-being and human flourishing? What would the habitat of flourishing look like for this context, for this community, for this other community? And it's not just looking at it, um, let's say, in the US, and we say East and West, for example, even in the West, there is homogeneous, um, um, heterogeneous communities in that context. And finding ways to specialize well-being within each particular um, uh, group, I think will make a whole lot of difference. Yeah, thank you. Definitely easy to appreciate the impact of place and uh, venue is amazing as this. Thank you. And last but not least, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, I should say that it's an honor and a privilege to be invited to participate in this gathering. Uh, I will use my five minutes to talk about the cultural uh, aspect of a project that I'm very engaged in at the moment, and that is the Inner Development Goals project. Uh, and in this project, we are looking at just a small fraction of what the Human Flourishing Project is looking at. 
we, we are focusing on looking at the skills and capabilities that we think is necessary for us to develop, both as individuals, but also collectively, in order for us to be able to meet the global challenges that humanity is facing, and specifically as expressed in the SDGs. So what are the inner development goals that we need to develop and cultivate in order for us to reach the sustainable development goals? Uh, this is a project that started a number of years ago, uh, not so many, uh, origins something like five years ago, and it's been mainly initially a cooperation between uh, Stockholm and uh, Boston, Harvard University, as a starting point. But then we had the ambition to go out in the world to really do a bottom-up project. So for the first framework that we developed uh, three years ago, we uh, went out to a thousand uh, academics, practitioners, religious people, uh, cultural people uh, in 20 different countries. And through and asked the, the same question to all of them, and that was what inner skills and capabilities do you think that we need to develop individually and collectively in order for us to reach the SDGs? Um, and then we had a researcher group who boiled these 1,000 answers down to 23 skills and capacities that we have divided into five dimensions. And I think that almost all those 23 skills and capacities are represented in, in your framework. Uh, we divided them in a little bit different way. So we divided them into the five dimensions of being, thinking, relating, collaborating, and acting. And just to mention a few of these capabilities, in the being dimension, we have like connecting to your inner compass, self-awareness and presence. Thinking could be complexity aware, awareness and perspective skills. Relating could be humility and empathy and compassion. Collaborating could be intercultural competence and trust, and acting could be courage and perseverance, for, for example. Uh, now we are redoing this exercise, and uh, this time we hope to be able to reach 100,000 people in 80-plus uh, countries. Um, and we have put a, a specific effort there in reaching out broadly in the global south, and we have some countries and some regions that we have difficulty in, re in reaching. So if any of you have got good contacts in the Global South, we would appreciate uh, co those connections. But what I think is standing out a little bit in, in this broader survey is the fact that we are trying to process this data in local language. So the first survey we did with a 1,000 answers were 20 countries, mainly from the global north, and it was all in English. Uh, now we are putting together, we have put together or are putting together research teams that are, that are working in, we hope eventually, 50 different local languages, and that will process the answers in local languages to then later translate it into English, but also making sure that we might not miss skills and capacities that we do not have any word for in the English language, and see if we can find gaps in that way. So then we are back to this language question that we were talking about this, this morning. What are we missing when we are looking at the world from an English language perspective? I will just say a few more comments on what uh, might di differentiate uh, the skills and capabilities in the inner development goals framework from the human flourishing framework. And one is that we are focusing only on inner skills and capabilities. We are not looking at outer skills, not physical skills or capabilities. So it's inner skills and capabilities. And then the next is that we are focusing on skills that we believe science can both measure, create psychological constructs for, but also show 
that they can be developed. Of course, intelligence is a skill or a capability that we would want to see much more in this world of, but it's very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's difficult to develop uh, intelligence. Whereas, for example, compassion and empathy, science clearly show that we can both widen and deepen our ability for compassion. Problem there, though, is that many of these skills and capacities cannot easily be taught in a normal learning setting, but require more immersive, uh, transformative learning uh, processes. So inner skills, skills that can be developed. But then, and also building a little bit there on what Brandon just mentioned about the fact that we also put a developmental dimension on the capacity. And that is something that I'm missing a little bit in the human flourishing uh, framework. The fact that we do as individual, not individuals, not only grow in these capacities and skills uh, during our childhood and adolescence, but the fact that we continue to develop our consciousness, our mind, throughout life. And when we are looking at these capabilities, if we take, for example, compassion and empathy, how we develop that and express that is, of course, very different if we are five years old or 15 years old. But it's also different if we are 15 or 45, or perhaps even 45 and 65. So how do we, when we are looking at these capabilities, take into account that we are all on a developmental journey throughout life and that these challenges look very different to a 20-year-old compared to a 60-year-old? And that might also have effect on what we mean by flourishing. Flourishing for a 15-year-old and flourishing for a 65-year-old should be different. I should also mention that inner does not mean individual. For us, inner development is individual, but it is also collective. And the cultural development and institutional development is very, very uh, important in this aspect. And I think we should also, when we are talking about culture and the cultural effect on human flourishing, not shy away from talking about cultural development, and also perhaps even daring to compare culture and ask ourselves, are some cultures more conducive to human flourishing than others? And of course, that question is very sensitive in our postmodern world uh, at the moment. My final 30 seconds would be to mention that uh, this initiative, the Inner Development Goals, works through corporations, through NGOs and through governments, but also through a growing grassroots movement where we have today more than 500 hubs uh, all over the world in 80 plus countries, and many of those in the global south. And every year we have a summit, and this October we have a summit in Stockholm where we hope to gather 1,500 people from all over the world for three days to discuss the importance of developing inner skills and capacities, not only for us as individuals, but for the flourishing of humanity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Monica, I'm glad you're here. We were able to have a few minutes from you, just if anything that you'd like to share in terms of cross-cultural and local perspectives, anything you think would be, you know, we should bear in mind as we do this work together. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Monica Aleman, and my perspective is mostly informed by being someone that sits in a large philanthropic organization, the Ford Foundation, which means that I mostly provide funding for things most, more than being involved in doing the actual research. Um, and obviously, quite a lot of interesting things come across our desk on a regular basis. Um, 
but from the perspective of, so, so that's one thing. The second thing is about 15 years ago, I was invited to work at the Ford Foundation because I come from an indigenous community and the time the foundation was uh, and it continues to be interested in introducing a different perspective for us to do our work. Obviously, from a place of understanding that if we want to reduce inequality, it is very, very important for us to understand the different drivers of inequality. And the realization that human dignity can mean different thing, the things depending on um, where you come from. So we have been on an experiment for the last 15 years at Ford. Yeah, and the objective of that experiment is to try to ensure that we have diverse staff and therefore that our proposals and our funding can be as diverse as our staff and that the cosmovisions that we are putting resources into are also informed by that diversity. It is not an easy, an easy task for us to, to be in because obviously um, it is very, very um, difficult for us to, to navigate the tensions of both universality and the different contexts in which we are working. And it becomes more difficult when that gets narrowed down to the level of a grant. You know, and you have to make decisions about where you put the resources and which values and which truth do you want to elevate in the world. Uh, however, that is part of the work that, that I am doing. Uh, the, most of the grant making that I oversee is particularly related to understanding women and gender justice and the work um, of understanding the concept of, of, of human evolution from a gender justice perspective. And what that means is that we are putting on the table the multiple genders expressions that we are having to contest with um, in order for us to understand the concept of, of dignity. Every day that I come to work at the Ford Foundation, I am very much informed by my upbringing as an indigenous person. You know? And what that means is that I am constantly making decisions on the basis of two basic principles. The one is the principle of the seven generations that my hope is that you are familiar with, which has to do with understanding the impact of your previous generations, but also of the next seven generations that will come to you. And the second principle that I apply to all the decision making around grants is the principle of uh, cultural self-determination, which means having the right to have your own identity, your own language, and your own understanding and cosmovision of the world. If you are an indigenous woman, however, it is important to put that into perspective because um, sometimes in the Western world, we navigate between the collective and the individual. It's no different uh, in many communities where that have been um, colonized. However, it is very, very important for me that we remove that dichotomy as much as we can, and that we do so in the, in, in the, in the way we are providing our, our grant making. So it is no different from understanding some of the values that you all were speaking about earlier today, you know, the concept of self, the concept of freedom, that has to be embedded in the context of a community and, and the, the context in which you are working. And I guess my last point that, um, that I want to raise is that um, my hope is that by being here, we can begin to understand some of the other concepts that have been essential for indigenous community for us to be in resistance and to flourish over the centuries. And some of those concepts include elements of duality, complementarity, solidarity, and obviously uh, the question of uh, human diversity. So again, you know, we can go into, into more in-depth about what those concepts mean, 
but it, in essence, it has to do with understanding that we, although believe in universality, still need each other in order for us to, to thrive together. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maria. That's such an important and um, how are we doing on time? Um, so I, I think what we'll do is let's take a let's take a break um, for 20 minutes. Coffee. I know I need some. So we'll meet back here at 3:35, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll we'll continue. Thanks, everyone.